Okay, uh, well, we are going to start with uh, some introductions. So uh, let's hear from the panelists. Let's start with you, Carl, if you can introduce who you are and what you, what you do. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to be talking to all your students out there. And I'm uh, here as, as a role, I'm a geologist and I work at the Department of Geology and I represent the master program in, in geology. I'm also a researcher and teacher at the department and study advisor and uh, also work with coordinating our exchange programs. Um, I can answer any questions related to our program, whatever whatever questions you might have. I could maybe also ask questions if someone has anything related to physical geography and and maybe even environmental science that those subjects were not directly represented today. Okay. Great. Yep. Now, thank you, Carl. And Ola? Who Hi, um, my name is Ola Wendt. I'm a professor of chemistry working at the Department of Chemistry. And at the Department of Chemistry, uh, we have a, a master program in chemistry where there are uh, three um, sort of uh, different, um, well, uh, structures, you could say. One towards uh, synthetic and analytical chemistry, one towards physical chemistry, and one towards biochemistry. And in addition to that, we also have international master programs uh, in uh, pharmaceutical technology and also in biotechnology, which are both associated with the Department of Chemistry. Okay, great. Thank you, Ola. And uh, Tina, can you hear us now? Yes, <laughs> sorry yeah, about perfect. that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm uh, Tina or Christina Ledier. I work at the Department of Biology, and we offer master's programs in molecular biology, biology, and bioinformatics. And uh, I am a, a biology or molecular biologist myself. Um, uh, yeah, and I take care of especially the molecular biology students. But I can answer questions uh, about all our programs today. Great. And Anna Maria. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna-Maria Persson. I am um, Associate Professor in Mathematics at the Department of Mathematics at the Faculty of Science. I'm also Program Coordinator for our bachelors uh, in Mathematics and a Master's Program in Mathematics. Um, we also have a, a Master's Program in Mathematical Statistics that we offer at our department. Um, I'm not the Director of Studies for, for that program, but I could answer some questions regarding that as well. Perfect, great. So we have a good spread of subjects here today. So hopefully we'll get some, some questions in um, for all of you throughout, throughout this webinar. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention here in the beginning uh, to our participants is that you will be able to uh, also upvote questions. So if you see that somebody has asked a question and you have a similar question, you can like that question or upvote that question, uh, which means that it will get up in the priority and it's more likely that we will uh, be able to catch that question. So please, if you see that there are other questions that um, you also have, uh, feel free to, to go in and like those questions. Um, I wanna get started with a little bit of a warm up question for everyone. Um, and I wanna ask more generally, um, why you think that students should apply to your specific program? Uh, or your subject, even if you want to answer it in a broader sense. So maybe we go the other way around now, and I start with Ana Maria this time. Why should students apply for mathematics, do you think? Well, they should only apply for uh, a bachelor's program in mathematics if, if they like math. Uh, and if they like science in general, and I'm not really sure uh, what to pursue, because mathematics is uh, a good ground for all of science. So if you start there, you could then, um, so if you like mathematics, but you like science and you haven't decided yet, um, you can start with mathematics and then branch out because you will get a, a, a solid background and a lot of uh, opportunities to create a, your own profile and um, yeah, go further in whatever direction you would like to um, 
investigate further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a broad it's a broad foundation for for many. It can take you many different directions. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Same question for you, uh, Tina. Why should students uh, study biology or molecular biology? I think we are offering uh, really good programs in each uh, subject. And uh, you should choose our programs if you're interested in the subjects. Uh, we can offer good programs and very engaged uh, teachers. Uh, the groups are quite small, between five to 25 students in each uh, program. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's quite personal. And yeah, I think you will like it. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ola, what do you say? What about chemistry? Well, if you're interested in chemistry and also interested uh, to study in Sweden, uh, we offer the uh, broadest master program in chemistry in Sweden, uh, where you, you can choose, you have a very high degree of freedom where you can choose among uh, a large variety of courses. And we can also say that we focus a lot on, uh, on practical work. So you will get a very thorough uh, lab training during your master. Uh, program. Uh, also in the master program, uh, we uh, were, you will work very closely with research groups at the university and you can do that almost uh, from the start. All our teachers are also research active and you have the opportunity to do up to one year of a uh, research project uh, within one of the research groups at the chemistry department. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's me then. Yes. Um, so yeah, in, yeah. to study the, our program in geology, we offer a very broad program. We cover most areas of geology. All our teaching is a mix of lecture-based, field-based and uh, lab work. So you, as a student, you get exposed to all, all aspects of a geologist. Uh, we also work very closely as, you, as a student will have work very closely with our research groups and researchers and you can branch out into the areas of geology that are most interesting to you it could be paleontology it could be mineralogy petrology or it could be more climate environmental change related questions mm -hmm. and we also have teachers from uh, or researchers teachers with background in in other subjects which are broadens the perspective for you as a student, mm. like physicists working with us and chemists, biologists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I think we, we're getting a few questions here in the chat and there are a couple of things here I just want to clarify so that we can uh, direct the right questions here to the right group. There are some questions here about biomedicine and I just want to mention that the biomedicine uh, subject and program is represented in the medicine uh, subject webinar that we will have in a couple of weeks. So uh, that is not a program that is uh, sitting within this uh, subject area of science. Um, of course, there is a lot of overlap here. Uh, we have some questions also coming up around biochemistry and pharmaceuticals. And I know that uh, both you, Ola, mentioned that you had um, some uh, connection there. And also I know that Tina, uh, you also have within molecular biology. So we might be able to cover a little bit of that, but when it comes to the, the biomedicine program specifically, I saw that there were several questions on that. That is not something that we can handle in this particular webinar. So then I yeah, would refer to the, to the medicine uh, webinar for that specific. So I just wanted to say that, and then we will of course come back to other questions here that are related to science. Uh, but I would like to ask one more sort of general question to all our panelists. Science is a core. Sorry? Ah, well, somebody. Um, another question to all the panelists that I would like to ask is, uh, what kind of students are you looking for? I mean, you partly answered it if you're interested in the subject and so on, but I'd like to hear a little bit more uh, like the ideal profile uh, of a student applying to your uh, program. Let's start with uh, Tina this time. 
Uh, okay, uh, yes, we are uh, looking for uh, students that are interested in uh, the subjects and uh, uh, very engaged. And I think uh, most of you will also be interested in research because our programs are very research oriented. And uh, you can do your degree project in companies, but it's most common to do it in the research group. Uh, at our department or at the uh, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, Anna Maria, same question to you. What kind of students are ideal for the mathematics program? Well, interested in mathematics, of course, engaged, uh, curious, um, asking questions, uh, loving problem solving, um, interesting uh, the theoretical part of the subject, but also in applications. So yeah, this would be the ideal student. Thank you. Uh, Ola? Yeah, we're, uh, we're looking for the best Bachelor of Science students in chemistry in the world. And those should uh, apply to our master program uh, uh, because you will uh, you will have a very good time here, and you will learn a lot of chemistry. And uh, just as my colleagues mentioned, we're I mean to a large part research oriented. Uh, around half of our master graduates go on to a, some kind of PhD program. And so there are very good opportunities to engage in research also during the master program. Um, we also have uh, other programs, as I mentioned, biotechnology, pharmaceutical technology. Those are programs uh, for uh, bachelors with, I would say, a broader background than just in chemistry. And those are also more oriented uh, towards uh, industrial jobs afterwards. Yeah. Sorry, you know, Fiona, I was Carl this time. I yeah, so, like to unmute myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think I don't know if you have an ideal student we're looking for. I mean, one thing we're looking for is probably diversity, is having students from different backgrounds, different countries, different areas of the world with different geology. But I think one thing that sort of brings us together here is love for the subject. Many of our students also like to be outdoors, working working in the field and being field-based geologists, even though we also do a lot of lab work and you can be working here without having the goal to become a field geologist. Um, we work you, as a student, our students, so, so if you have strong interest in research side of geology, it's a good place to be. And we, we, these are students that we take well care of. But then our subject, at least in Sweden, I know in other parts of the world as well, there's a very strong job market for highly trained geologists with deep subject knowledge. And that's what you get from our program. So a student who wants to come into a working life is also well served by our program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, mention a few things here that have come in through the, the Q&A. We are getting some questions about um, entry requirements and, and uh, backgrounds and the kind of scores you need and all of that. And I just want to answer kind of to, to all of the, those of you who have asked these kind of questions that um, there are different things we need to look at here. So it's if you're applying to a master's, there are usually two sets of entry requirements, one that is sort of the general entry requirements to study a master's in Sweden. And then in addition to that, you have the specific entry requirements uh, of each program. So um, if you have specific questions to any of the programs that are represented here today, when it comes to the master's specific entry requirements, uh, you're very welcome to ask that. For the programs that are not represented today, uh, it's hard for any of the other panelists to answer specific entry requirements for those. So then it's better that you send us your question and we will um, answer uh, either um, my colleague now, uh, Rebecca, who is answering the q and in the background, or you can email it to us and we can uh, direct the links to, to those um, specific entry requirements of the programs that are not represented here today. Uh, when it comes to the admission to bachelor studies, 
that is handled at a national level in Sweden. So that means that um, there are specific rules and specific entry requirements based on where you did your upper secondary school or your high school. So again, that's also a uh, kind of question that you would have to email us and depending on your background, we can give you some more details on the entry requirements for that. Um, so that's something that we uh, won't really be directing to the panelists today. I just wanted to say that to, to all of you, because I see that there have been a few different questions related to um, entry requirements for, for bachelors specific. So um, we'll try to answer that in, in writing here in the back end, and otherwise you're welcome to, to email us and we can explain a little bit more about how that works. Now back to our uh, panel, we've been talking a little bit about the kind of students you're looking for and what's special about your program, but I want to dig into a little bit more of the content now. I know we get a lot of questions from students who want to know more about what does a typical day look like as a student in your in your subject? Or how many lectures are there? How big is the class? What does uh, what can you expect as a student on your programs? And and this is a question I would again like to direct to to the entire panel. So we'll we'll go <laughs> lap around all four here again. Uh, if we start with Ola this time. Um, what, what does a day look like if you're a student in chemistry? So it will uh, depend a bit on, on uh, sort of which type of chemistry you choose to, to go into. Uh, but typically you will have, um, you will have lectures, uh, you will have exercises and you will have lab work. And in some courses, uh, you have a lot of lab work, you can have up to maybe 30-40% uh, of the time spent over a period of, of uh, seven, eight, nine weeks for a course can be spent in the, in the chemistry lab. But of course, for other courses, you will, you will do less. Then uh, as you progress in the program, you will start doing projects within research groups. And then you will spend uh, a lot of time uh, in the research groups. Uh, and also that work will usually be uh, quite lab intense. Thank you, uh, Ola. Uh, Carl, what, what is yeah, it? So like study geology? Yeah, so our, a typical day at geology we're quite intense with teaching at geology and you have usually teaching with lectures and exercises, lectures in the morning and exercises in the afternoon. The exercises could be both from working with samples to doing microscopy work or other lab work. We also have a lot of field-based teaching on every course. We have extensive field trips and field work, field-based field teaching and can be anything from going out on a cruise, taking sediment course in, in the Öresund Strait to going to a glacier in Norway or to a volcano on Tenerife. So uh, uh, um, in addition to doing shorter field trips in more nearby areas. Coming up uh, and in, on each course, we also have individual assignments, projects that's going to be handed in and usually in a written exam on most courses. Uh, on the second year as a master's student working on an individual master's proje project, most students worked very closely in the research group doing an independent research project. Could be field-based, could be lab-based, but always involved practical work of some form. Yeah. Thank you, Carl and Anna Maria. Well, it, it depends. Uh, if you're a beginner, so if you're a new student at bachelor's level, that's that's a lot of teaching. We, um, um, th there are lectures, seminars, um, meetings with mentors. So um, I'd say uh, if you if you like to study with others, then you will be on uh, eight eight hours a day. Um, you can also study um, more or less on your own if if you prefer that. So it's it's uh, not compulsory to attend all these activities. It's it's rather a service that we provide. Um, but as you move towards um, probably master courses at more advanced level, 
then uh, the number of lectures a week on, on one course um, is probably around two or something like that, but you, you are taking uh, several courses in parallel. So it, it depends. It depends whether if you're taking courses in pure mathematics, then you probably will hang out in a library with the uh, books or probably, I don't know, um, work with your friends. Um, if you work towards statist to statistics or numerical analysis, you might work on more applied uh, projects. So, so yeah, it's a little bit different depending on where, where you are at. Mm. Thank you, Anna Maria. And uh, Tina? Uh, yes, I, th I think for all our subjects, uh, maybe with a little uh, exception of uh, mathematics, everything is included in, uh, in the courses and you take just one course at a time or at the most two courses in parallel, right, Anna Maria? Not more than two, right? So I think that's a little special for Sweden, that you can concentrate in uh, one subject at a time. And uh, as I said, everything is included. So in biology, you have uh, lectures, literature seminars, group work, and field trips. In molecular biology, you exchange the field trips to lab work. And in bioinformatics, you have lectures and uh, computer work all days. <laughs> and uh, normally, uh, this you are scheduled 20 to 30 hours per week but you are supposed to spend around 40 hours per week exactly uh, so that's what a day look like yeah yeah <laughs> it's interesting it's it's great for us also to hear because we get a lot of these questions from from students as well what, what does it actually look like uh we're getting a lot of questions here in the q a uh i see we have a lot of questions for physics and unfortunately we don't have a representative for physics in this particular webinar today hopefully we will have someone um in, in we have another upcoming webinar for science within our application week in november and hopefully we can have uh, someone there to answer physics questions directly but a lot of this applies to all of the subjects as well. So there's actually a question here, um, which was directed at the physics bachelor, but I wanna ask the panel um, for your programs, uh, what are the research opportunities? Is there research at bachelor's level and is it a practical program? So those, uh, again, those questions were specifically for the physics bachelor, but I would like to ask them in a broader way. So within your programs, um, what does it look like in terms of research possibilities and how practical is, is the program? Uh, we'll go the other way around. So I'll start with you, Tina. Yes, I, uh, so for uh, physics and all our subjects, I think, <laughs> uh, you, um, maybe not mathematics, but you have a lot of practice uh, during the program. And you do a research uh, project in the end. You have a a, a bachelor thesis in the end of the program. And it's uh, either half a term or a whole term. Sometimes you can choose between 15 or 30 credits. Yeah, so you get both practical experience during the studies and then you do like a, a deep dive into the research uh, when you do your thesis work. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so, Anna Maria, how about mathematics? Well, um, mathematics, I, I would say it's a little bit special because uh, I think many of our applicants at bachelor's level know mathematics from, from high school and they have a certain idea of, uh, about what mathematics is. But uh, the field is quite broad and it includes also mathematical statistics and numerical analysis. So, depending on, um, okay, so when you start, for instance, a bachelor's program, you get um, like a block of compulsory courses to build a solid ground. But after that is uh, set, then you can decide whether you specialize towards mathematical statistics, for instance, or you combine that with financial mathematics. So you can branch out in, in, those, in, in those directions. Um, and that would be more practical. The same is with numerical analysis and scientific computing that can be combined with courses in computer science um so it's again a little bit more practical if you're very interested in pure mm -hmm. mathematics for instance then um 
I would say the research opportunities will come uh, by the end of your um, uh, of your studies more at master's level. So um, the research that is done in pure mathematics, um, it's it's hard to get there within the within the bachelor's program. But um, if you're interested in pure mathematics, then you would probably take a master's in pure mathematics and uh, go towards research in pure mathematics at, um, as a PhD student and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have all these different specializations and opportunities, but can it, it, it depends on what you're choosing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> And I can also say for for physics a bit because um, actually our bachelor's uh, bachelor program at the Faculty of Science is one program with different specializations. So physics and mathematics are simply um, different specializations within the same programs. And, and as such, we have um, quite similar structure. So within. Um, for, for instance, if you start your bachelor's in physics, you need to take courses in mathematics, at least one and a half semester, that's the compulsory, you get the compulsory uh, courses in mathematics that are your mathematic toolbox for uh, future phys physics courses. Um, and also in oral programs, you, you are um, required to take uh, at least one semester of courses in other subjects. Um, and, um, yeah, find different subjects that interest you that can combine with what you want to um, to work with in the future and so on. Mm. That's great. Thank you, Anna Maria. Uh, Ola? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose uh, Christina sort of mentioned that, which also applies to chemistry. I mean, we, we have a uh, uh, we, we have a lot of practical work, both in the bachelor program, where we don't have any international, um, um, you cannot apply internationally, but in the master program where you can apply internationally, we also have a lot of practical work. And then of course we have research work uh, towards the end where you can do up to one year of, of uh, focused research work mm -hmm. within a research group. Great. And I could add, I mean, you can also do that in industry. Uh, and uh, we have a few students who choose to, to do their uh, final work in industry. And we have good contacts with several of the chemical industries um, uh, and industrial labs uh, around Lund. So if one is interested towards that, it is, can also be arranged, although it's, most students don't do it. Mm. Thank you, Ola and Paul. Yeah, I think the same is true for 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 geology, what you just heard from from chemistry. We we offer our bachelor's program in Swedish, so it's not open to unfortunately not open to international students. Um, as a, but as a bachelor student, you will be exposed to research. You will have researchers lecturing, and you will read research articles, and you will do projects where you need to 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 read uh, scientific literature and so on. You in the bachelor bachelor thesis, it's uh, half a semester, and um, you will sort of get your first little glimpse of how to do research. It's not really a research project on the same level as you will do as a master student. But they prepare you. But the bachelor program is also also equally prepares for a job outside academia. We have applied courses in geophysics and hydrogeology and contaminated lamb, uh, soils with a more applied courses mm. coming up on master's level no but this was for bachelors <laughs> yeah right no oh, well i mean it's, <laughs> yeah. I, I asked so, a question more generally so yeah fine, so coming yeah. up on master's master's level the the courses tend to be more research intensive and you will deal with more research or research like projects within the courses and then you have the master thesis of one and a half semester mm. which is an independent project mm. quite a lot of our students do these projects outside in companies with more applied questions having a supervisor also at the university with us mm. 
Mm, mm. It's a little bit of a mix, more, more research intensive than masters, of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, all panelists. Uh, this is interesting again, and I think it's a good mix. Seems like all programs have quite a good mix there between uh, research and uh, your, your practical aspects and theoretical aspects. So, uh, and tying into that, we have a question here in the Q and A um, that is related to the pandemic and the situation uh, that we should mention a little bit uh, as well. And I want to direct this specifically to uh, Tina and Ola, since I know that your programs, of course, involve uh, lab <laughs> sessions and, and so on. So how how is that looking now in terms of students being able to access the labs and so on? Uh, we have to remember that the students who, those of you who are looking to apply this year, you are not coming until August, 2022. So it's quite, quite a long time ahead, especially in the world we are in now. So it might be hard for us to guess what the situation is like then, but maybe you could describe what the plan are right now anyway. Tina or Ola? I can start by saying that, of course, when the pandemic hit, we, we had to uh, sort of, um, well, think about what to do. And we uh, decided almost immediately that uh, chemistry without lab work is not chemistry. You cannot have a chemistry education without doing lab work. So what we did was that we did not uh, take away any lab work in, well, maybe in one or few, a few courses, but in principle, in, in no, no, none of the courses, we took away any lab work, but we just uh, adapted the labs so that they were uh, uh, safe. So by, by having fewer students in the lab, working alone, having uh, protective shields, et cetera, et cetera, so that we could uh, perform all the lab work in, in a safe way. And I'm happy to say that we have not had any uh, sort of uh, spread of disease within our labs as far as we know. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we will be back to the normal type of lab work as of November 1st. Yeah, yeah. And how about your labs, Tina? It's the same for uh, us. We, we continued with all the practical work. Uh, we just made risk analysis and uh, everyone were wearing uh, face masks and visors. Uh, so it was quite hot, <laughs> I think sometimes with lab coat as well. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but we, we had more, um, uh, rooms and everyone was uh, doing lab work alone mm. and uh, regarding field trips we just uh, rented more buses <laughs> uh, to keep the distance within the buses as well mm. so uh, but all lectures have been uh, online and they are still uh, online but yeah. after the first of november most courses will uh, go back to normal Mm. And not all. Some liked having lectures online. So mm. one or two courses will continue doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this student who asked the question was actually a biology, uh, interested in biology. Uh, so I will continue with you, Tina, because there was another question related to the program in um, aquatic ecology. And uh, the question is, uh, it was for that program, but I think it's perhaps more general as well, uh, because the question was about the, um, that there sometimes is specific entry requirements for specific courses that are different than the general sort of entry requirements to the program. And I think that that might be the case uh, for, for many of your programs that, that the entry requirements might be quite specific to individual courses that are not the same as when you are applying to, to the whole program. Is that something you can explain a little bit more, Tina? I don't know if this was about elective courses or, or courses that are part of the program, but just in general. Um... Uh, yeah, I guess it can be like that for elective co courses. Uh, um, I can uh, not uh, uh, figure out what this problem was, but uh, all compulsory, you should be a led eligible for all the compulsory courses, of course, but there could be some exceptions among the elective courses mm -hmm. so that you need more chemistry, for example, yeah. if you study aquatic ecology. Yeah. 
Uh, I have another question here from uh, the Q&A. So uh, this is one is for you, Anna Maria. It's a quite a broad question, so I guess you can are free to interpret it as you want. But the question is, what are what are the benefits as a master student in mathematics? Well, um, I I would say that we offer a high quality education uh, with uh, um, a lot of flexibility that is interesting to the to the structure of the program so um if you use your time well um and know what you want then you are um, you can prepare yourself for lots of different uh, job opportunities um i think we are uh best of preparing students to to get to um, research studies or P, to pursue a PhD program, uh, especially in, in uh, analysis. So that's, um, if you apply for a master's program, um, I would say anywhere you should, uh, as an applicant, look at the research profile uh, of that institution or that department that offers the program. So uh, in Lund, we are strong in analysis um, and um, yeah, um, if you're interested in, in, in that, so then Lund is a, is a place for you. But we have a lot, uh, um, lot of research going on. Um, we will also uh, start a new master's program in, um, in scientific computing, hopefully soon. Um, we also we already have a um, master's program in numerical analysis. That is again uh, very flexible, and um, you can yeah. I think it, there there are lots of opportunities, but you you would need to know a, a bit what you want, especially at, at master's level, and and check the research profile of uh, of the department mm -hmm. if it suits your interests. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have actually one more question uh, for you specifically, Anna Maria. So I think we'll do that now that we are already uh, talking. <laughs> so we have a question here from uh, Maria, and she is saying that uh, I'm currently studying for a bachelor degree in mathematics in Italy. Uh, and she's asking if it's possible to transfer uh, over to Lund University. And then she would also like to know what kind of opportunities do students have uh, once they finish the degree, but because she would love to get into mathematical research. But she's been told that in Italy, there are very few possibilities on doing that. So she wants to know what the possibilities are here. So um, I would say that um, our, our best students um, are oftentimes pursuing a PhD studies. Um, in, in Sweden, in, I mean, in, in, in Lund, in Sweden, um, and, and abroad as well. Um, so the opportunities to do research after finishing your master's degree in, in Lund are, are great if you work hard and if you are on that top. Um, um, portion of the, of the students, the student population. Um, it is possible, I, I was actually on my way to answer uh, Maria's uh, question, it is possible to transfer, but this, um, it, it's, it's a little bit um, different, whether, I mean, if you, if you, if you want to transfer during the uh, studies at, at bachelor's level, um, then, the procedure is usual, usually that you contact the director of studies or the student counselor, that, that's me, just to, to uh, um, get a, a preliminary, um, just to have a preliminary discussion about what the possibilities are, but then uh, you simply apply for the bachelor's program to start with, and once you are a student uh, that is already admitted to our program, you, you can apply to for transferring the courses and be moved to the later stage of the program. So, so that's, that's one possibility. Um, however, we can um, grant such applications and uh, to the later stage of the program 
um, if it's um, if the student has more than just the, the degree project work uh, left to obtain a bachelor's degree. Because um, we would like to know the student before um, and, and the capabilities and um, before attempting uh, a degree project. So uh, if you're in, uh, in the second year or something like that already, uh, you could apply for our bachelor's uh, program and, uh, and then apply to get transferred to the later stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're in um, the last phase of your bachelor's uh, education in Italy, then I would suggest that you finish that there and then apply for a master's in Lund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be a better option. Yeah, and I can say uh, in general that is the situation because we get that question a lot uh, from from students who are interested in transferring into the bachelor programs, um, and in general it is just like Anna Maria explained that you would have to apply to start the program from the beginning, and then if you get admission. Um, you can discuss with with a study counselor or the director um, if there are courses or credits that you might be able to sort of account for or or transfer so that you can skip a few of the of the courses and don't have to retake them again. But in general, you would need to uh, apply to start from the beginning and not just jump in directly uh, to a second or a third year, for example. Uh, that's usually the case for, for most of our programs. Um, and we do get this question because in other countries, transfers are quite common, but in Sweden, it's not as common that we switch around during uh, an ongoing bachelor uh, program. Um, we have a question here which is directed to really anyone in the panel who wants to answer. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, from Irsa, who is asking, what is the percentage of students who do their master thesis at Lund uh, versus who do it uh, at a company, for example? And I think that within science, I think that many of, of the students uh, maybe go, go into the research groups uh, at Lund rather than maybe at a company. But well, let's see who in the panel would like to answer that question could be anyone so i i don't have a percentage but i i would say it's less than 10 percent of the students in our science master programs go into companies if you look at the ones in biotechnology and and pharmaceutical technology the situation is quite different where you, it's sort of upwards towards 50 percent that do it in industry yeah, so I, I agree. I think uh, in general, uh, I would also think there's numbers or something like that. In geology, some years we are maybe a bit higher than that. We have quite a few students who want to get out and do their master's and bachelor's thesis in in uh, a company. And we normally every year we have a, at least a few students, mm -hmm. bachelor's and master's that go out and do, do external um, master, prog master the, um, or bachelor pro project. I know that in environmental science, the number is probably a bit high, e higher even, and there are a lot of environmental science students that do the master, master projects and bachelor projects outside of, outside of the department. Mm -hmm. And actually have a, we'll have a follow-up question for you specifically, Carl, so you can, you can stay yep. on the line here. Um, <laughs> Uh, Benedicta is asking, um, well, she's asking in general, what are the benefits of the master's in geology? You did talk about this in the beginning, but maybe we can repeat that. And then also specifically related to this question, um, do you have any links with companies and where students can easily find a job after they have completed the master's in geology? Yeah, so I'm going to take the second question first about since we were talking about the master thesis here. So no, we don't have any, we, we have contact um, with uh, companies and we can set up contacts with, with students. We, if we have, comp, comp, sometimes we get, uh, through our contacts, we get offers, like a company is looking for a student to do, be involved in a project. It happens sometimes, but in general, if you're a student and you want to do an external project, you need to be very, you need to drive, be the, the one who is making it happen. You as a student need to be the one taking contact, making the contacts, finding the right project and so on. And it can be a little bit difficult sometimes for our students to 
go out and do this. And we try to help out as much as we can. And we usually help out with contacts, our colleagues, former students from here and so on. My general feeling is if you really want to, you make it happen. It's no problem and we will help you. And we will always find, it, it usually is possible to find a suitable project and supervisor, at least for geology and environmental science. I don't know if I should say more about the benefits of studying geology in Lund. We already talked about it. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to do a, a quick recap. <laughs> I think one of the benefits of being in Lund is that we are very, we, we cover almost all, every aspect of geology. There are a few things we are stronger in, of course, and a few things which we are not going in too deep to in the master's program. But we are very, very diverse and we have strong links to, especially maybe to the climate side and environmental side of of geoscience and geology. Um, so if you're if you're looking for a program where you can sort of both get a bit of a broad introduction or a broad perspective of geology and then dive into some of the aspects, it's a good place to be. Thank yep. you, Paul. Uh, we were getting some questions here in the Q and A about uh, this was actually on my list of questions anyway, so it's good that it came up here. Uh, so questions about generally the acceptance rate, how many students are enrolled in the programs. We got it specifically for bachelors, but I also want to ask for the masters. Generally, what is the class size? Um, how, yeah, and the acceptance rate for your for your respective programs. And I would actually like to ask all of the panelists this if you can give us an idea about uh, the number of students and so on in your uh, respective programs so starting with tina uh, yes i think i mentioned it before but we accept between five to 25 students per uh, program and then in you share you take the courses together with the other program students and maybe exchange students and programs from other other faculties and departments so in in the courses you are probably between 20 and 40 students something like that so quite small classes Anna Maria? well at bachelor's level so uh... In, in mathematics, we have this uh, two different admissions uh, admission rounds, and there are about 20 to 25 students admitted in each round, so between 45 and 50 each each autumn. But actually, uh, because of the, I, I saw, I've seen that there was a question about uh, how big the lecture halls are and what's the student population. So our math students are taking the, the introductory courses in, uh, together with students from um, other programs in science, especially physics, uh, astrophysics, theoretical physics, um, and also students enrolled in teacher education. So um, at interactive level, we have about 130 students, um, I would say, starting each autumn. Um, but then at master's level, um, we admit approximately 20 students every year and at the courses at advanced level, which can be taken by students at our bachelor's level, but interested in, yeah, um, specializing. Um, I would say that the class, the, the smallest groups would be very specified courses, about 15, um, largest 40 to 60, but typically around 30. Yeah. Thank you. Ola? Yeah, so we take in uh, around uh, 45 students uh, at the overall chemistry master program, but there are three tracks. So it means that uh, the students are uh, subdivided into different courses and they vary a bit in size, but, but generally between, between 10 and 20 students, I would say, per course. So also here, I mean, generally fairly small courses. And also, as I said, in some courses, we have a very uh, strong lab load, which means that we cannot take in more than uh, maybe 12 or 16 students because we cannot fit them into the lab. So, mm. uh, yeah. yeah, that's the, the way it generally looks like. And it, out of these 45 students, probably half or, um, have their degree from outside of Sweden. 
Thank you, Ola. And Carl, for geology, how large is the class there? Yeah, so on the bachelor's program, we admit around 20 students, between 20 and 30 students each uh, autumn. We only have one intake for the program. Um, on the on the master's, we have two two parallel courses, or two actually three tracks, but two parallel courses running all the time. And we are between 10 and 20 students on the courses, so between 20 and 40 students. It varies quite, I mean, we, we've seen it, it can vary a little bit, maybe down to below 10 to above, slight just above 20. We can't really do more than 20 on most courses because of it gets too complicated before field-based training and field-based field trips and so. Mm. Um, let's see, it was, yeah, and we're about, probably about half of our students are international students, mm. of ex exchange students and international program students coming into the program. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we got some questions here in the chat also about uh, uh, selection and how you select your students. Uh, Pedro was asking here, for example, that uh, often he sees in the selection criteria that we've written uh, based on your grades from your previous degree. And he's asking, but which grades in particular? So if maybe just one of you can answer, how do you generally view when you are doing the selection to the program? Or, and it, if it is mainly based on grades, how do you assess the different grades? Is it the overall GPA or are you looking at their grades in the particular subject only? Or just give us some idea of how you sort of weigh these factors in the selection. Um, whoever wants to jump in. Uh, can do so. I, I can answer yeah. that question. It varies a little because uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are just looking for the general GPA, but I know that some programs, uh, they check the grades for natural science courses only. So it's a little different. So, mm -hmm. so check the selection criteria carefully for each program. Yeah. Thank you. I, I could just add that. Uh, so when I'm evaluating student applications for the master's program, uh, because these are the only applications uh, we um, look at, we do not evaluate students at applying at bachelor's level, and probably this is known um, to all participants here. But at master's level, so I, I, I look especially at the courses in, in mathematics uh, and numerical analysis that are relevant for the program. And of course, you uh, take into account the, the um, GPA and the overall grade, but uh, what is most important to me is um, for the application, um, the grades on the relevant courses in, in maths that are preparing for, for uh, the master's program. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a general answer as well, uh, just like both Tina and, and Anna Maria saying here, it, it, as you can see, it varies a little bit. I mean, some programs will look, uh, you know, both at the GPA and the specific courses and more, or more focused on one or the other. So it varies a little bit. And there may also be other selection criteria as well, um, if the program is asking for additional documents, for example, that could also be a part of the selection. So the important thing is to read it carefully, as we mentioned here, to make sure that you understand fully the admission requirements and the selection criteria uh, before you make your application. Uh, there's still a few questions. We only have two minutes to go, and I would like to uh, give some final, give the panelists a chance to give some final words for, the, for their programs. Um, so I'm hoping that um, Rebecca here will be able to uh, get to some of your questions in, in the chat or in the background. Um, so you all get your answers, but I do want to give the final word to the panelists. So in one minute or so each, <laughs> if even half a minute each, if you can uh, just give us some final words uh, about your programs or final message to the students who are with, with us today or who will listen to this recording after. Um, again, coming back to why should they apply to your program? Anything else you want to mention that we haven't already spoken about today? Should we start with Cobb? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for listening, everybody out there. Um, <laughs> so I would I would say that coming to coming to Lund is is a great experience, and coming into geology in Lund, you will come into a quite small department, and you will work very close with the teachers and researchers, and we have a very good sort of student group, and very 
very active student group. So I think even if you come from far away from a different different country, different culture, you will quite quickly feel a home here, or at least I hope. And then I can also say that if any of you are in Sweden or come by Lund, just contact me and you can come and sit in on the lecture and I can show you around the building and uh, where, where, we, where we are. And if you have any other questions, just contact me through email or call me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Juan. That was a generous uh, offer there. Come and visit the lecture. So uh, <laughs> hope that yeah. some of you uh, take that opportunity. Uh, Ola? Yeah, uh, I could say that if you are interested in chemistry, I think uh, applying to Lund uh, would be an excellent opportunity where you will have a program that is where you can choose uh, quite freely among different courses and you will also get to know a large number of teachers who are all research active. And we have, uh, I mean, I would say that's probably typical for all of Sweden, but we have an atmosphere where you will uh, have no problems getting to know your teachers and, and you can have a, a, a very open uh, relationship discussing uh, things uh, uh, without uh, hierarchies between uh, teacher and student. And that I think is an opportunity uh, that uh, you should uh, take, take advantage of. Absolutely. So, uh, and I think also Lund as a city is something uh, that you will find quite appealing for a, a young person. Absolutely. Thank you, Ola. Anna Maria, final parting words. I, I can nothing but agree. Lund is a wonderful uh, student, uh, sorry, city for students. Uh, and um, we have an international environment where you will feel uh, at at home, wherever you come from. So Lund will be a place uh, on your heart forever. I started as an international student myself and here I am 27 years later. So yeah, that's a living proof. You will fall in love with Lund, sorry. <laughs> living proof. Yes. Uh, and Tina. Yeah, I agree that the uh, relation, relationship with the teachers is very relaxed and I think uh, everyone appreciate that. The doors are always open. Uh, also regarding our programs, they are very, very flexible. And so you can change a program, for example. And we also have a lot of possibilities to do practical work. You can do... Uh, um, you can do, uh, uh, in addition to the degree project, you can do other projects, applied works, go abroad and do traineeships. So it's a lot of flexibility and possibilities. Thank you, Tina. And if with it, that... Maybe, uh, maybe if if we just have yes, just a quick thing, yes. and also remember that in many programs you have the possibility to also include other subjects. You can combine geology with a bit of physical geography, maybe chemistry, depending on your backgrounds, your prerequisites. And and remember that that you, mixing mixing it up could be a good thing that can make you see other other ways and other paths through the education. Absolutely, that's a good that's a good point. Uh, thank you so much to all of our uh, participants and also to our panelists. It's been enlightening, hopefully, for, for all of you participating. It was certainly enlightening for me to listen as well. Um, we understand that you may have many more questions. And of course, there will be more opportunities to uh, join our webinars. Like I said in the very beginning, we have about 90 different virtual events going on this fall. We will also have another science webinar later in November within our application week. So you're very welcome to join us then again uh, and ask any additional questions. Of course, you can contact us via email. Uh, hopefully Rebecca here can paste uh, in the chat in the background uh, a link to where you can contact us at Degree Studies uh, on, our web, uh, on our website, through our website and direct your questions that you may have uh, that we didn't answer today. And again, uh, the webinar has been recorded. So if you missed a part or if you have friends who might want to watch it, uh, it will be up on our website uh, within a few days. So you can find it there again. 
So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you later on in Lund in a year or so. So thank you, everyone. And uh, goodbye from us. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you and good luck. See you in Lund. <laughs>